Now, I'm, I really put them essentially in, in three columns for you. The opioids, those are all the narcotics. And most of them that we'll be talking about are mu agonists. We'll get into that later. And then there are some exotic ones that are agonist antagonists. Just know that if you never know the drug, you're going to look it up anyway. But at least you'll learn the mecha mechanisms of the most common ones. Then we have the non-opioids. We have acetaminophen. And then we have the non-steroidals. They're in different categories because you remember, Tylenol and ibuprofen are not the same at all. Acetaminophen or Tylenol is a non, it's not a non-steroidal. And then we have adjuvants, those that uh, drugs that have been are really used for other things, but they found to be effective with pain. And we use primarily the anticonvulsants and tricyclic antidepressants. There are others, and I'm only throwing it in for you to know that there are other things to do, but we're not going to be responsible for the other adjuvants in the final column. Okay? Let's go. Okay. Method of administration. If the patient needs it, we'll find a way to get it in. Okay, just look at all the ways we can do it. All right? Um, I should have put there sublingual. That's the vasculature in your mouth and under your tongue is so powerful. You could put liquid morphine in there and get it. They'll be absorbing it too. So there are lots of ways. Lots of stuff is being done right now on nasal um, administration and also intraocular. So there's a lot of stuff going on about pain medication and how to deliver it. And, and all medications and how to deliver it. Okay, oral, of course, is the most exp inexpensive. It's simple and non-invasive. It's slow in onset, but just as effective if you're giving it IV once you get it into um, around-the-clock delivery. And, of course, it's preferred in cancer and chronic non-malignant pain. Intramuscular, very, very rare. I mean, if somebody comes into the emergency room with trauma and they're, they're going to go home and one intramuscular delivery is fine, but it has more disadvantages than advantages. It's more painful, and absorption is really unreliable because different levels of fat tissue and muscle tissue in different people, we can't really say that they're absorbing it well. Um, people who have taken them, you know, they've been allowed to give themselves I am uh, dosing, have come up with muscle fibrosis and abscesses, and it's a very poor choice for elderly. And that's because even if they look thin, there's been a shift to uh, fat mass rather than muscle mass. So you really have a difficult time getting into a muscle with them, and I wouldn't use it. I'd never use it with anybody around the clock. And the children hate it, so try never to do it if you can avoid it. Okay, the most efficient is intravenous because we can titrate and get the patient uh, rapidly under control. And you can maintain a steady state better, and this is true with any medication given IV. And it depends, of course, on venous availability, and you have to be watching that IV, make sure it's open, it's not infiltrating. It's more expensive because it requires professional oversight and expertise. This is coming back. We won't spend time on it. Has anybody seen Clyces or subcutaneous dosing? You have. Where have you seen it? We used it at the hospice for a patient. Right. Okay. It's very special. What What's unique about it? Um, we don't have. It's our elderly patients that don't have venous access. We just put it in their belly or in their thigh. Yes. And it, the um, the dose is different because remember, you know, if you would dilute medication in a larger amount of fluid IV, you'd really not do that. So, you're, so the concentration of the medication is different for subcutaneous. They used that a lot when I first started out. It was called the Clysis. And it's effective, but it's becoming more popular now in hospice. Now, there are topical agents, and you've heard of, I'm sure you've heard of capsaicin, right? 
Well, it's over the counter and people are misusing it. They're not using it properly. It was made from hot chili peppers because the research indicated people in countries that had high sp spicy foods had a lower pain threshold. So that's where it comes from. So you sh if you have a patient who's willing to, pers to use it appropriately, this is what the deal is. S one of the neurochemicals in the neurochemical soup is substance P, okay? So let's say somebody is putting this on their knee. Encourage them to put gloves on, rubber gloves, because that's very irritating substance. You get it in your eye, you'll need morphine. It's that painful. So they should apply it and you have to tell them, or you have to get a contract that they're willing to do it properly because it's going to hurt more when they apply it because it's going to generate more substance P. But if they do it after about three days, what happens is they depleted the production of substance P. And they got to keep doing it, otherwise they go back to the whole thing and again. So they get real relief that can be sustainable. And of course, the drug company says it's 14 to 28 days, but we we see it earlier if they apply it three to four times a day. But they must know that it's going to hurt more. And are are they willing to do that? And if they're not willing to do that, that's not a good agent for them. And when I'm in CDS or something, and I hear people saying, "Oh, get a couple of tubes of that. Just put it on your knee." I want to die because they're not getting the right information. And then they'll say it doesn't work. It made it worse. <laughs> so lidocaine. You see the lidocaine patches that are being used. Oh, incidentally, Capsation has just come out with a patch, brand new. So we have to look at that and see what that involves. Lidocaine patches are used very effectively um, for particular things like shingles because if they have pain along the nerve root, it's one of the only patches, you, and I stress that, that you can cut, and you can cut it to shape it along the nerve root. Uh, lidocaine, uh, they figured out what kind of surface area, how much lidocaine should be, be absorbed because that, that can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So, You've got to use it right, all right? And, and if you use it appropriately, and this again, like what I talked about before with something else, on for 12 hours, off for 12 hours, okay? Then you get the best result, and no more than three lidocaine patches in a 12-hour period, and then you take them off. And oh, oh, uh, again, we've got to stress that only to intact skin. So if the um, shingles lesions are open, they're going to absorb more lidocaine. So it's only dry, um, closed uh, blisters, and then along the nerve root, OK? Because of the cardiovascular problems and uh, CNS problems. But if used properly, that's never going to happen. Now, there's been some controversy over how you get rid of these patches and even narcotic patches that we'll talk about. So far, the direction is we can flush them down the toilet, okay? Small children and pets get a hold of one of these things and lick it, they can die, especially with our narcotic patches that we have, but with lidocaine too. So that's something we always ask. Do you have grandchildren at home if it's an elderly person or young children or pets? Because it can be very dangerous for them. Now there's been some people saying that the patches are very dangerous to fish, but so far we're flushing them, okay? <laughs> Okay, now we're going to talk about prostaglandins and pain, all right? Prostaglandins, this is an important slide for you to look at, increase sensitivity to pain, all right? That's what they're, hormone-like hormone substances in our body that when there's injury or disease, it heightens your perception of that pain, and it, do, it does it because as part of our evolution, you learned if you put your hand in the fire, get it out fast. The prostaglandins alert you, it hurts, and it's going to hurt more, okay? So prostaglandins increase sensitivity to pain. This will all be clear when, when we go over the chemistry chart, okay? Now, prostaglandins, don't be frightened by the way this looks. 
she's scared. Okay, they're hormone-like substances, and they require something called arachidonic acid to be, uh, to be um, activated so they can be used, okay? So when you have cell injury, you've got arachidonic acid breaking down prostaglandins, uh, synthesizing prostaglandins. You'll never be expected to know all of this, but these are important. This particular prostaglandin has to do with platelet aggregation. These are all good things. It increases your sensitivity to pain, which is good, okay? Uh, helping you with clotting is good. Uh, uterine contractions, all these different things it does. Vasodilation of the, of the um, I'm on my tether here, of the renal, Art of the renal system, of the vasculature in the renal. Leukotrienes over there keeps your bronchus open uh, and patent. So these are good things. It increases your sensitivity to pain. It keeps the vascular or the venous flow through your kidneys. It helps you with platelet aggregation. It causes uterine contractions, and that's what we use in labor. And it keeps your bronchus um, patent. Aren't those good things? We like prostaglandins, okay? What does it do? Oh, the gut, that's a big one. I should not have missed that. Okay, what does it do to your gut? So the, it, it protects the, um, the gut lining by um, decreasing gastric acid production and it increases gastric bicarbonate secretion. It increases mucus, it increases blood flow. So for your gut, it's pretty good. Renal vasodilation, and the, the numbers before, PGE12 or 2 or PGI, these are the ones. But these are the particular prostaglandins. All you have to know is it helps with vasodilatation. It inhibits sodium and chloride reabsorption. It's great for fever uterine contractions, and increases your sensitivity to pain. These are all healthy prostaglandin activities, okay? Now we're going to inhibit them. What does something like ibuprofen do? It decreases your sensitivity to pain, and it interferes with all those other healthy things. So these things are not safe in huge doses. We have 75 million people with gastric either serious bleeds or small bleeds just from taking too much ibuprofen because they're tired of arguing with their doctor to give them something more for pain, pain relief. So although ibuprofen and aspirin, aspirin is the mother of all of, the, of these, this class, although they're good, there are limits on how much you can use. And for you, like if you take ibuprofen for a headache or something, you shouldn't be taking more than 4,000 milligrams a day. And for elderly people, you want to be in the 3,000 range and not regularly. If they need it regularly, we have an artificial prostaglandin that we can give them to protect their gut. But what you need to know, that people are popping these ibuprofen, things like that. There are like 25 different varies, and it's hurting your gut, your bleeding capacity, your, your bronchial status. I've, I've seen people um, get an asthmatic attack when they had been stable, when they were taking ibuprofen because of the leukotrienes, okay? So be aware that these are not as safe just because they're all over the, the uh, pharmacies and over the counter. Now, at, we won't spend a lot of time, but aspirin is a COX-1, and we're going to get into deciding what that means, okay? That's a, COX-1 means the, the enzyme uh, from aspirin and from ibuprofen and all of those, they're, they're involved with COX-1, okay? Now, sufficient, this is the next slide you should know. Okay, of course, COX-1 is, this is exactly, if you inhibit it, you get the gastrointestinal problem, the renal, all of this what I just said. Um, and these are, now, this is important to know. If before surgery, you tell people to stop taking aspirin, the reason you do this is that, that the enzymes destroy all platelet activity, okay? That's 
That's serious. That's why they tell you to not take it. It, de it, it destroys all enzymatic activity. So bleeding time will be altered until new platelets are produced, and that's in six to 10 days. So that's the reason we hold it. You've r really knocked out the active site of platelet um, cyclooxygenase. Now, what about with ibuprofen? Well, with ibuprofen, the enzyme function is restored after about five half-lives. So that would be about five times four. Uh, 20 hours. So that's less, it, and it, it, it inhibits it. It doesn't irreversibly stop it. Okay, whereas with the ibuprofen group, you really stop the production. Okay, that's why it's serious. Okay, COX 2. Again, we have the arachidonic acid breaking down uh, so that we can synthesize prostaglandins. All right. On one side, COX-1, that's, you, you give COX-1 and you, then you, I mean, COX-1 is produced, rather. I'm trying to look at this here. Let, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. These are the protect, COX-1, that group, produce protective prostaglandins. You give them non-steroidals, the ibuprofen group, and you get these problems. So then what happened was we came up with COX-2, and the beauty of it is it would only go to the inflammation site. And we thought, oh, this is the answer, because it only produces prostaglandins for just the inflammation area, not any place else. So we think it's going to protect the stomach, intestine, kidney, and platelets, right? Well, it did, and they started to give it to everybody in nursing homes, and people who couldn't move were walking around with their walkers. It was great. It was like a miracle, but they weren't watching the store, so they started to get cardiac arrhythmias because of the sodium retention and all of that, and they started to get congestive heart failure. So the two of them, Celebrex and Vioxx, were t Vioxx took the hit harder than it should have, and the reason it got the hit was because of the over-promotion of it by the drug reps. It was a good drug. It was an attempt to get pain relief without hurting all these other things. So you'll see now that uh, Celebrex is, is being prescribed, and I think people are just so afraid because of the suits with Vioxx. They're the same type, and Mobic is, uh, I think it has Celebrex and ibuprofen. It's COX-1, COX-2. So you see them slowly coming back. But again, it, we really thought this was the answer for people who needed anti-inflammation drugs. And that's why it was taken off the market, because it had other side effects. But who in the name of God would ever want a new drug? Would you? I want it out the first year. I want to see how many people died, how many people had other effects, and then maybe in a year, I'll take it, but not until. So, like, really, look at things that have been on the market a long time. You'll have patients looking in magazines or television and say, oh, I want that. And they really are pressuring healthcare providers to promote them. It's dangerous until you know what it, it takes five years before the PDRs have all the adverse effects because you have to report them. So your patient has his arm fall off or something, and you record that, and you send it in, and then they say how many people, I'm trying to be facetious to keep you awake, will have reported that their arm fell off. Then it will be reported, 12% had. And that's what you see in the PDR, because but people are reporting it. So new drugs, not so smart, unless it's a rare disease and it's the only thing we can possibly come up. Okay, so. These were the two drugs, and generally for all non-steroidals, whether they're COX-1 or COX-2, you never give it to people with low renal function, remember, because it has to deal with the um, vasodilatation of the kidneys. Avoid in anybody with um, ulcers, peptic ulcer disease, if, of course, anybody who's actively bleeding, and don't use multiples with one exception. The little tiny baby aspirin for cardioprotection is fine with them, but not. you'll hear people taking a little of this and a little of that, and they're really, really in trouble because you, now you know 
what happens when you inhibit prostaglandins. Expect ceiling limitations and recognize there's a difference between analgesic and anti-inflammatory dosing. Now, we have some parenteral, um, toradol was always the one that we had in this country. For years, ibuprofen and acet acetaminophen is not a non-steroidal, but these two are now, were used in Europe for five years. Right now, we have them IV, and we'll move into that in a minute. So this is the toradol. You can come back and look at it, uh, but I want you to know that ibuprofen is now available. IV has the same problems with uh, the inhibiting good prostaglandin effects. Um, and, and these are things you can look at if you need to, okay? Because any time a patient is getting a medication, just look it up in your book and see what it is. But what I'm giving you now is an overview so you know non-steroidals and what they do. Uh, and now acetaminophen. It's not a non It does inhibit some prostaglandins, but it primarily has central activity very minimal anti-inflammatory, and it's, it really is good for um, fever. Now, the maximum dose for a healthy adult would be four grams. We have people on the kidney transplant list from Tylenol, taking too much Tylenol, and they've wrecked their liver. So they're on the, what did I say, kidney? No, liver transplant list, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> They're on the list because they've either taken too much or an overdose with acetaminophen is dangerous because it does totally wreck your liver, okay? And now it's IV, okay? So we have it in this country finally. And I just put them in there. Now, what do you know about controlled substances? Do you know how they're ranked and how they got to be ranked? Okay, it's very interesting. You know who the subjects were? Incarcerated drug addicts. Doesn't that make that highly scientific? Yes. Okay, so what they did, I don't know who did it. I'd rather not know. <laughs> they used incarcerated drug addicts and they gave them various substances, and it was ranked according to how they, they liked it or didn't. But the, the Schedule One we don't use in this country very much for, uh, we used to do some LSD research, but nobody, these are, you, the, there's no use for this except if it was a rare research thing, but you're not gonna use this in this country. However, we've got a problem now with marijuana being uh, legal in several states. Um, uh, we don't know. I mean, we've always had it in the form of Marinol, which was, um, it's a pill form, uh, treated because a lot of AIDS patients had nausea that was really helped with Marinol. But uh, it's going to be interesting because it may be legal, but you have marijuana and your random drug test, you're out of here. I don't care how legal it is. I mean, that's the way it's going to be because it impairs uh, Cognition. Okay, Schedule Two. These have a high potential for abuse and they can lead to dependence. So look at them all. All of those, no surprise to you, right? Schedule Three. Substances have a potential for abuse, but again, not as bad as two. And it may lead to dependence. So you'll see now why Vicodin was the most commonly practiced because it was Schedule Three and you didn't have to put it on a special. Um, script form. You can put it on a regular one. That's why people used it. So these are Schedule 3. Schedule 4, would, this is, uh, there is some potential for abuse and it's scheduled accordingly, so you have to be careful and it's being monitored now by most of the drugstores uh, according to some laws that have come down. Now 5, that it has very little uh, potential, but people are using cough preparations. I got a little notice of that. They're really buying up cough preparations, so they're stopping that now, so to, or limiting your number of uh, cough preparations that have uh, codeine in it and, and some other things too. Dextromethorphine. Dextra okay. Now, who in the name of God would overdose on? Um, low modal, I don't know. But you know what? Some of those drug addicts are pretty wasted. 
and you, they'll take anything, some of the ones that are in such bad shape, so uh, maybe they'd take that too. Now, the narcotics that we primarily talk about are the mu, they turn on mu receptors. Now, it's important for you to know that the mu receptors are throughout the central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord, and the gut, okay? Very important, underlined, and the gut. So, you start someone on a narcotic, you better start them on a bowel regime right away because the mu receptors are going to slow down the gut. And I was an expert witness on a case where somebody kept complaining of pain, they kept giving her more narcotics, nobody checked, she perforated a bowel and died. So, you've got to be on a bowel regime, you've got to be monitoring that. Okay, you always get nausea and vomiting. You always get constipation. This is initially sedation. We're scared to death of respiratory depression, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. And itchiness and urinary retention. These are things that can happen if you turn on the mu receptors, okay? The nausea and vomiting goes away, but we usually cover it with an anti-nausea, knowing that the first three days. Constipation never goes away. All of the others will, but constipation never goes away. And we've got some interesting new drugs for that now. Okay, morphine. Um, morphine is the gold standard. You've heard about that. and It's way back into the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's, just, it's been around for a long time, and it's an excellent, um, excellent new uh, ag agonist. There are two metabolites. Uh, that you can get into trouble with if people aren't clearing. Um, but generally, I would say if you know morphine and you use it and you see how your patients are doing in the hospital setting, it's relatively safe. Now, the next couple of slides, or that slide I just passed, will tell you it comes in oral form, it comes in liquid, it comes in suppositories, it comes in uh, uh, many, many ways. Okay, so, th but just know a little bit about morphine, what it turns on, and what all new receptor agonists do. There's a new one on the market now. It's just come out. You don't see it uh, a lot lately, but it is beginning to be used more frequently. And the, they're, they like this because it turns on mu, but it also blocks reuptake of one of the neurochemical soup things, nor norepinephrine. Okay, again, I don't want you to, you're not gonna have to memorize doses in this, but if you're giving it to a patient, you will know what's safe. You'll look it up in your book and safe. I'm just giving you an overview. Now, oxycodone, it's been a great drug, Percocet for a long time. Uh, it comes in many different ways. It used to only be Percocet 5 of oxycodone and 325 of Tylenol. Now look at all of the different ways it comes. So if we think of Tylenol and we got a ceiling of 4,000 a day, you wouldn't want, if you look at Percocet 10, 650, imagine if you gave that every four hours, look at, you'd be overdosing them with um, Tylenol. So it would be far safer to give them a separate oxycodone and then dose the Tylenol separately. So it's just to get an idea. Again, when you're working with patients with this, you'll begin to see uh, what you need to know and uh, when to interfere if they're really giving them a lot of Tylenol. Tylenol with codeine is useless for adults, really is. Um, only 10% of codeine uh, degrades to morphine, so it's a teeny weeny bit. It's great for kids, post -con um, tonsillectomy, they can swallow it liquid codeine, but it's really, this is my favorite, not because I use it, but it's the cleanest mu, mu agonist. Um, it, it's so great. It, it really has a longer duration and it's great. I mean, IV diluted when, you, when somebody's acutely ill postoperatively, it, it's just really good. It also comes in oral form too, some special things with that. And again, you only need to know that when you're giving the drug. Fentanyl is uh, another one of our narcotics we use a lot. It can only be given IV or in this lozenger thing on a lollipop stick that you can put in the mouth to absorb. You won't be using that too often, but fentanyl is 80 times more powerful than morphine sulfate. So when it's very effective, 
it, it has an active metabolite that's benign, but you really have to know what you're doing when you're working with fentanyl. And that citrate, um, people were getting a little casual about it. Uh, they were calling it the fentanyl lollipop, and that certainly puts it in a different category. Um, it's great for induction for anesthesia. Yes? Do they still use the fentanyl patches? Yeah. I'll, yes, I'll get into that very soon. This is the most hated drug on the market, Demerol. Okay, does anybody know why? It's what? Absolutely, it causes all kinds of problems. It causes CNS irritability and seizures, okay? Because it has a neurotoxic metabolite called normaparidine and so dangerous has this been that now the American Pain Society has recommended that it never be used more than over, more than 600 milligrams over 48 hours and then stop it. It has a fatal interaction with particular um, antidepressants and the oral one is worse. There's no more neurotoxic metabolite in the oral form, of course, than the than the IM or the IV. Now, there's only there was a big movement in this country to remove it from pharmacies, and many did. They were declaring themselves no Demerol zones. In the place that I was working, we changed to dilute it and got rid of Demerol, except for two reasons: post-operative sh shivering. That's really dangerous because they, they're using so much more energy. They need more oxygen and with the shivering, and it's dangerous at that time. Five milligrams of, of Demerol IV, and it'll stop on a dime. The other area is amphotericin when they start shivering with that. So, that's when I, so I was against taking it off the pharmacy, but you restrict it to the use where it's the best. It's so cheap, too. That's why everybody uses it. Wherever you go, they say, Demerol, you know, if they go for colonoscopies, that's what they give them. It's, it's a dangerous drug. Okay, now, the reason I have this on there is, is for you to see that if you get real comfortable giving one particular narcotic and the, and the patient is switched to, a, to another, this gives you an idea of what the switch is. Imagine if you're used to giving out 10 milligrams of morphine and hydromorphone is diluted, and the doctor orders 10, min 10 milligrams of diluted. Look, look what you do. You certainly better have Narcan around because you're going to knock them out for good. Look at the fentanyl. 0 0.15 micrograms equals 10 milligrams of morphine. Uh, Meperidine is, is um, Demerol and 75 equals it. So you've got to see, don't get so comfortable with giving a certain amount and then when there's a switch, get your drug book out quickly and make sure you know because these could be dangerous. And I'm going to leave these for you today. You pick them up later. This is an equal analgesic choice of Haldol. They would kill the patient, but the person, the nurse may not have known. You know, if you get too familiar, so we really have a lot of precautions out for that. Now, there are no long-acting narcotics. There are mechanisms by which we can formulate them so that they will be long-acting. Okay, so and they, they have the same side effects and all the other things, but we're trying to slow release them because if you're on a medication, you're you have chronic pain and you're on a narcotic. I mean, having to take it every four hours, you have a, you know, it's never even. So having the first group, the morphine sulfate um, and the oxycodone uh, group in 12-hour formulations was great, okay? Now, we had a problem with the, all of this oxycodone use, okay? Now, remember, drug addiction is a full-time job. Okay, because most of the agents last four hours, then you've got to go get another one. So you, that's why they're hidden pharmacies and stealing things. So that's what they do. And they have more time than we do. So they discovered that if they, if they got one of the 12-hour agents, wow, that can be a little time. So they, they're they hitting pharmacies. That's why you see the pharmacist not wanting to even hold it on, on you know, in the pharmacy. 
Um, they're pretty much the same. They have, they can't be chewed. They don't ever. If somebody in a nursing home thinks that they can crush it and put it in a cotton in into a, a feeding tube, they can't, they're going to be they're going to have a real problem. Also, if you break it in half, you don't know. It's not scored, so you don't know if you're going to get all of it on one side and nothing on the other. So these things can't be messed with, all right? They take it whole. And if you're, say, monitoring a patient that, that has long-term needs for narcotics and you have them on a 12-hour agent, you always have a four-hour agent of the same thing. So if they have what we call breakthrough pain, and then if they have a lot of breakthrough pain, you add up that, and then you divide it by half, and then increase their 12-hour doses. So we, we can handle it and keep them smooth. Okay, oxycodone, um, just as good, but it had a biphasic delivery system that made it preferred on our side, because with MS cotton, you don't really get any effect after the first dose until about 10 hours. But it, so we usually covered them with small, short-acting agents, but the thing with oxycodone is you get immediate release of some, and then you, it, the lag time to get to a steady state is different. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Now, you asked about the Duragesic patch, the transdermal fentanyl patch. I have had the unpleasant task of uh, being an expert witness on mismanagement of the fentanyl patch. Um, this is an extremely powerful drug. It's fentanyl. Remember how much more powerful than even morphine. So nobody should ever be on this, this patch unless they are using regularly at least 18 milligrams of morphine a day. Then they can be converted to a low patch dose. And it's never used for acute pain, absolutely never. And the, us the, the thing that you have to know about this is that when you put the first patch on, what happens is when it's, let's say you put it here, it takes 12 hours for a depot to be formed under this, into the subcutaneous uh, skin. So what happens then is at that point, it slow releases to the system. So the patient is not getting any relief for that. So again, we cover knowing they're not going to get any relief until that depot starts releasing. You never start anybody higher than 25 mics, even if they truly had used about 18 milligrams of morphine a day. It does provide 72 hours of pain relief. And then again, that's a great idea for somebody who has to take medication all the time. Now. It releases, the difference here is when you get a dose of oxycodone or morphine in those 12 hour agents, you're getting that dose over 12 hours. With the fentanyl, you're getting, say, 25 mics every hour, not over 72 hours. So some of the, the worst case I ever saw was a, a very active 62-year-old lady and have pictures at her Disneyland with her kids, and she's having, so she had her hip replaced. She left the hospital, went to the nur nursing home for some rehab, and every time she had more pain, they slapped another patch on her, and she died. And I remember the autopsy picture was unbelievable. She was wallpapered with fentanyl patches. Now, those people didn't know what they were doing. They shouldn't be giving a drug that they don't know anything about, and how tragic this was. So, you know, where was their thinking? They were not trained, certainly not educated, so they slapped another one on. I was doing a graph, at, you know, after 12 hours, she got this much. I mean, they killed it with hundreds of milligrams of fentanyl, and it, it was just, not knowing what they were doing. So these things cannot be cut. They never cut it. You, it. The depot goes into the skin. If you make a mistake, you've got a real problem with any of these long-acting agents because what's the reversal agent? Narcan. Narcan. How long does Narcan work? Short acting. Very short, 45 minutes. You've got a 72-hour agent on that patient. 
or at 12 hours. So they go to the ICU for an Narcan drip. So that's the danger when you're using this. Sometimes they're hard to find too. Hard to find what? The patches when you have patients that are unresponsive. Okay. It's hard to find the mm. patches on them to know that they're even using them. Somebody told me, uh, some graduate came back and said, I'll never forget that fentanyl thing. She said because her son was unresponsive and they were going to defibrillate him. And she said, wait, he's got a, a patch on. And she, she showed them he had 50 mics of fentanyl and they used the Narcan and he revived. Yeah, so if you're putting one on, what you should do with a Sharpie, the date and the time, the time is essential. Because if somebody makes a mistake, we assume on the long end, 10 hours before the depot, maybe it would be shorter, but you've got to cover for that time. And I had that because what, in this big level one trauma center, uh, the, I started doing education pieces with the nurses. And, and one of them came on duty and somebody's on a patient going home, put a 50 mic fentanyl patch on her. And, and I'm not saying this because of any conflict between disciplines. It was a PA, a brand new one, and said, oh, we'll put that on. And the nurse called me immediately, and I, fortunately, they had the date and the time. Because it was so dangerous, of course, we took it off. But taking the patch off doesn't empty the depot. That's still under your skin. We took it off, and we, again, to. It, we didn't know if all of it was there yet, but we weren't taking chances. She went to the ICU. So these things can, yeah? My husband works psych, and when he was a tech there, um, we had him know what type of patients should not. Nursing homes were using the patches. Those that were doing it appropriately were throwing it out with the trash, OK? So drug addicts were going through the dumpsters, Mm -hmm. cutting them and freezing them and then cutting them like little chiclets and putting it under their tongue. So then we had to say that all patches, all duragesic patches, had to be put in the narcotic box. Yeah, but again, you, you know, who would have thought? Mm -hmm. So there, now why was that? There was a little left in it. Remember, most of it's in the depot, but when you take it off, there's still some in, in it. We don't know how much. But that's what makes it possible for you to put the second patch on when you take this one off and they get some fentanyl right away because there's still something. Mm -hmm. in, and the, uh, the depot hasn't completely eliminated what's in there. So that's a dicey thing with that. But that's true. That's what they did. So that changed the policy. You can't cut them. Uh, you, the other thing is you can't go into a hot tub. You know, people with chronic pain, when they get relief, may go on a cruise or something. And if they're sunbathing, what happens if you, or the patient has a fever? That patch is going to really put out more fentanyl. So you get that fever under control. You'll get them out of the sun or out of the hot tub. And also, you know, when you first have to put one on, has anybody worked with fentanyl patches? OK. Now, you the only two out of this class. So once you start to use something or you see it prescribed, work with the, the more experienced nurses to know these things about it and get your drug book out and look, OK? Because you can't memorize everything. But if you have general principles that, and you have the, your, your drug books around, you'll be able to feel that you can safely administer it. OK. So again, it's the heat thing, fever, never used for post-operative pain or outpatient surgery, and um, the initiation of therapy, never more than 25 mics in opioid-naive patients. And what we mean by that is if somebody's regularly on a narcotic dose and it's being prescribed, they are a little different about when you prescribe something else for them, another narcotic. An opioid naive person is somebody who doesn't regularly take um, a prescription narcotic, okay? They're more at risk for everything because they're they haven't developed any kind of tolerant level. 
Okay, there's a new one out. I have no experience with it, but the drug people are pushing it, and it's Butrans, but it, it's supposed to last seven days instead of three days with the Dergesic. Now, look at the problems there. Seven-day thing, somebody doesn't prescribe it properly, or there's a problem. Well, that person's going to need Narcan for a week because it's low rela mm -hmm. re releasing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, PCA... Now, just an overview, you need to have a, a very cooperative patient who can use it appropriately and not have all the relatives and friends come in and press the button. Mm. We've had real serious problems with that. So the patient has to know that they're getting a, hopefully a background dose, so when PT comes or something, they may need a little bit, gives them control, they don't have to wait for a dose, and we control and program the pump so that it's safe. Any problems with uh, looking at lawsuits over PCA narcotic problems, they really were the issues were the nurse programming, not the not the pump. Okay, so be real careful. If you don't know how to program it, don't program it. Get somebody there that can do it properly. And if you think that it's a little hokey thing with a pump, take it off the unit. Don't leave it because somebody else will say, "Oh, I could get it to work and plug it in and <coughs> harm a patient." So w that's true of any equipment. Get it off the unit. Okay. Um, one of the things I hate is when people, uh, w you know, they're getting a dose and they don't have a, a PCA dose, and they wake up after they slept, and whatever they were supposed to be getting isn't enough. So this way they can be really in control of pain. Um, so again, you have to have the patient's ability to know how to use it. One of the I mean, you get, we got terrible calls, and we got funny calls. When I get a call from a nurse, this guy, he's on this PCA, and nothing's working. He, he's been in pain all morning. I go up, he's pressing the light cord. There's an education piece there that has to be. He has to know what to press, and you got to give him the right thing to press. So you always go in and look at it. Now, I'm not going to get into the order sheet, because that will vary from facility. We do also have epidural PCAs and epidural analgesia. That's real. You need a lot of training to get that right, and most places don't because it because they don't have the ability to give that kind of training. Okay. Uh, you, sometimes you you will have either morphine or fentanyl, and you'll usually have an, an anesthetic in it. Uh, the more, whatever is in there has to be non-preservative. Okay because it, most of the stuff you give them, IV or whatever, has preservative in it. But in the epidural space, you can really harm a patient. So it's preservative-free when it's used. Okay, here, finally, we have something for people who need to be on uh, narcotics, and we really don't want the issue, this serious issue, with prolonged uh, constipation. So there's a new drug on the market, and uh, uh, you'll see it being used now in nursing homes because that's where a lot of patients may spend two or three years on narcotics. So we use the Relista. It's brand new. Um, and just be aware, and it's already in your drug books, so you can look it up, okay? But it is, in, it's really given with, it could be given in hospice too because not everybody dies in 30 days with hospice. Hospice can be two years. I mean, that's, Unfortunately, people go in there much later than they should have. They should have been on, on hospice earlier. Um, it's a subcutaneous injection, and it's really effective. Yep?
then you can do it. You can do it with a spouse in a situation like that too. But not everybody, and not everybody who comes in and presses the button. By proxy, now if somebody misused it and kept doing that, you would have to, you'd have to get, you know, administration and security on, you just don't let them do that. So the patient has to be intelligent enough to know this. If there's somebody by proxy, it's not, oh yeah, I'll do that. They have to be trained and it's very effective. But this is what I'm, I didn't want to, um, sometimes I forget to tell everybody, you can go online and get all of these free of cost. There's a position paper on pain management at the end of life. There's a position paper on being part of euthanasia. We can't. Uh, but now the fourth state, Oregon was the first, Washington State's the second, Montana the third, and Vermont is the fourth that permit assisted suicide. But we don't participate in that. The doctor can do it. Okay, here's on pain management with people with addictive disease. This is just giving you an idea. You can go online and download these. Use of placebos in pain management. No, no. That's trickery. Uh, as needed range orders, these are so awful. I used to hate to come and open a chart mm -hmm. and the doctor has codeine, oxycodone, morphine, and God knows what else. So somebody comes on duty and says, oh, I'll give him this. And then someone comes on the next and gives him something else. The guy's not in, in any pain relief at all. He hasn't been in a steady state of everything. So the range order things really have to be looked at. And there's an all neonatal circumcision, and here's PCA by proxy. So these are just some, but you can go online and download them and you'll feel comfortable if you have to bring attention to somebody in your facility. Okay, we have been bitten. Now we talked about alternatives, we talked about drugs, and we also have invasive techniques. We can use nerve blocks, but they don't last all day. They may be four hours, but if you just need it for four hours, that's fine. We can destroy the nerve, and that's frequently done with trigeminal neuralgia, either by heat or cold. Uh, you can do, a, you can cut a nerve um, where they enter the spinal cord, and that's called a rhizotomy or cordotomy. We can do those things for advanced pain conditions. And of course, then this whole thing here is on Narcan, and I think uh, I think we talked about that enough uh, to know that it's it's going to reverse the narcotic. But let's say it's somebody who just got too much IV morphine. We still know that it lasts 45 minutes. Uh, what you want to do, the patient, if you want to get the patient breathing at least 10 respirations. So rather than shoot the whole thing in, because then they get no pain relief, mm -hmm. and, and also overshoot phenomena is dangerous because it can cause um, seizures, tachycardia, or all kinds of stuff. It's usually people are so nervous they're going to do that. So generally what we did is we put it in normal saline, two cc's. We put a little bit of the Narcan, I think it was like uh, 0.4 milligrams, and tapped it in to get the respirations. Okay, So don't shoot it all in and then get it up. Now, if it's a long-acting agent, you gotta have a whole different protocol. But when anybody's on a PCA, I like to see the, the Narcan tape to the wall right near the PCA because, you know, where is it? What, if you take five minutes and somebody's not breathing for five minutes because you can't find the Narcan, mm -hmm. that is extremely bad. Where are we now? Okay. Now, tolerance. Tolerance happens with any drug. If you're taking, say, a, 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 an antifungal agent for a fungus disease, uh, say a, a rash, and you're doing the same dose, and it's, you're out a year and you're not getting that much result in, anymore, you increase the dose, okay? Because you're tolerant of that. It, it's science. It happens to every drug. So what happens when somebody is is being prescribed, let's say outpatient, uh, let's say Percocet uh, four times a day. And this is going on for a while, keeping the patient comfortable. And he comes in, or she, for her, her um, checkup and says, 
I don't know. I, I, it's just not working as much. The patient doesn't know why we should. We're science people. Because look how long the person's on it. So one of two things have happened. The receptors have been down-regulated, so that means they need more to turn them on, or there's been degradation enzymes interfering, so we increase the dose. However, this will be the time for you to hear things like, this guy really likes his Percocet. You know, stupid things like that. It is not scientific, it's pejorative, and it's, it's wrong, it's unethical. If you, he likes his Percocet, it's helping his life, and now he's become tolerant. That's not addictive. That is a scientific phenomenon. He needs more. That's all. Addiction is a whole different ball, okay? Addiction is not tolerance. Addiction is when you're using this stuff to the detriment of your life. You're not showing up for work. You're stealing things. You're doing all... So you, or you're using it just for the buzz, not for pain relief. And believe me, if you were in pain and you were prescribed narcotics appropriately, you don't get a buzz. You don't, because you're getting it for pain. But drug addicts that don't have pain are getting a buzz. So we only consider it if patients no longer have control of the drug use and, and they're calling constantly for refills. So part of our inpatient, inpatient team, we had a pain clinic. We had a, patients all, and it should be anywhere. They sign a contract. There will be no early refills. And you'll, you'll follow the protocol or you won't come here anymore because we won't give it to you. <coughs> and they have all kinds of tricks and we knew every one of them. Okay, I mean, where the, the, you'd laugh if I told you half of them. I mean, the things they think they could <coughs> tell us. But anyway, we, if now, supposing somebody calls for an early refill, do you immediately say, guys, you can, maybe there's advanced disease. Mm -hmm. So we assess, have the patient come in, and maybe, maybe the person did take more without calling us because he needed more. And that would be a legitimate tell him, don't do that. Now you gotta call us if you need more and we'll either x-ray them or do whatever we have to do to assess and say, yeah, look at this. So we, if you have that kind of trusting relationship with patients, you can pick out when you've got a serious problem. I, I know one of the tricks they did was they looked in the phone book and they saw their doctor's group and they called ahead to see their doctor was out of town. So they called the covering guy and said, he always prescribed this to me, and I guess he forgot to give me my prescription before he left for his vacation. How clever. I mean, they just, they have all the time in the world to do that stuff. So we catch him, and they know, and they're out of the clinic. Okay, now we have to really contrast pseudo-addiction with addiction. So you hear, and, and it's really burnt out nurses that do this. That guy's on the buzzer 10 minutes before his pain, his pain medication is due. Let him wait a little bit. Tell me you haven't seen things like that. What happens with pseudo addiction, there's a real fear of uncontrolled pain. So to give you an example, the guy's pain is nine. You give him this piddly amount and it's down to seven. I wouldn't be on the buzzer, I'd be out at the desk, pounded. So when we came up and did the consult, what we find out, he's so under-medicated that he's, you know, the difference between being in excruciating pain and being miserable is getting that low dose on time. So when we do that, it usually means that that the person is under-medicated, so that's pseudo-addiction. But you'll get attitudes like, ugh, he really likes it, he's calling all the time. When you see this, you better believe he's gonna call all the time. Now something has come out because of the anxiety about addicting patients. This is a narcotic, a long-acting morphine with a sequestered core of Narcan. So if you take it as directed, the Narcan passes through the system without any trouble. You chew it, and you're <laughs> you've just blocked out your morphine. So you're not going to do that. 
because the Narcan takes over. So that's one of the things on, on the market now. Now, when do you need, see, every hospital should have a, well, they now have wound care specialists and diabetic spe pain specialists because they come up and they negotiate with the patient and the staff and the doctor and figure out what's going on. So when should you call them? When pain is uncontrolled or poor. And special populations, addicted patients, end-stage end patients, complex syndromes, some of that reflex stuff, oh, God, is that... That is absolute hell for patients. Sickle cell cystic fibrosis. Now let me tell you about addicted patients. If you have a heroin addict who's now in a car accident and he's fractured three bones and he's got some lacerations, what do you think you do with his pain management? Well, first of all, you need to know what is the first metabolite of heroin morphine sulfate. So even though he's taking the heroin for the buzz, he's getting morphine sulfate all of that time. So we just say, be honest, tell me what you take, and we'd figure it out with the pharmacist. And they needed more than what we would normally give people because they're getting morphine all the time, and that wasn't their goal. But they're in the accident. We have to, we have to treat them. And it should be the pain team because there's so many attitudes around the clock with physicians and nurses. So they're very uncomfortable. So when they can call the pain consult team and you say this is what you prescribe, they do it and the patient's comfortable. I think that's the last slide. Yes? What do you mean when you say metabolite? Well, when something is broken down, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it breaks down into different metabolites. Some of them are benign. With Demerol, it's neurotoxic, that metabolite. So ask me the question again. I don't think I got it. What do you mean when you say metabolite? Like what you were just talking about, the two, with the heroin addict, you said morphine is the metabolite. Morphine is the, the heroin breaks down to morphine in the stage of breakdown. Okay? I'm glad you clarified that. Do you have any questions of me?